it's hello everyone it's 13 30 and um, yes i think we should start the triple if uh, workshop right now because we do not have a lot of time and um, yeah i think maybe some more attendees will arrive later but let's start anyway so thank you very much for your interest in the triple if um, framework and i'm going to uh, give some details and insights about how triple if works what it actually is and how you can, could use it in your in your application um, let me start with a with an introduction of how it what it actually is i think everyone knows that or it's it's still a common situation that libraries museums and other cultural uh, institutions uh, have own repositories of metadata and digital images of their objects of their holdings and provide a web interface to search them to view them and so on and but um yeah what, what's the problem with this the problem is that data in such uh, situations are not interoperable you can you cannot use them in uh, digital workspaces for instance you can't integrate them right from their repository uh, into other applica applications for instance into storytelling applications in games whatever comes to your mind especially in the context of hackathons uh, for instance these this data is not interoperable you can't interlink it with uh, with other data just right away and um, there is a solution for this problem and it's called triple if triple if is the abbreviation of international image interoperability framework and it's um, yeah it's a set of apis api standards and i'm going to um yeah give some more information about that in the next minutes um yeah this is the uh this is the the goal of of triple if a world where uh, the repositories are interoperable provide interfaces that can be integrated in other applications in other web uh, websites uh, in order to use them in other contexts and to for instance make annotations or um, to talk about in a technical way talk about other resources so the digital images in those repositories become uh, some sort of linked data yeah, you know linked data in other contexts it's it's um, it's uh, a way to make data interoperable to make um, statements about remote resources and to to link data between institutions between contexts between different branches and you can think of triple if as some kind of linked data for images IIF was uh, invented by a, a community um, uh, from um, very different and uh, important institutions worldwide. For instance, the Stanford University Libraries, the British Library, uh, the um, uh, Bayerische Staatsbibliothek in Germany, for instance, the Vatican libraries, the National Library of France, and uh, other important uh, institutions were involved in inventing Triple IF. And today, there's a really a very large um, um, community of uh, libraries, archives, museums. For instance, the Internet Archive uh, also adopted Triple uh, IF in the meantime. Um, uh, that, that's the triple if community today so and let me start with some uh, examples on on how triple uh, if actually uh, works or what what we could do with it um, um i one thing uh, if you have got any questions or um 
or comments or something, then please do not hesitate and uh, raise your hand or write something in the chat. I try to watch the chat uh, so maybe I can answer your your questions or your remarks um, if you feel like so. <laughs> okay, um, good. I, I want to start with an example uh, on, for instance, how scholars could benefit from IIIF. I want to start with a with a very uh, important uh, object uh, in the collection of Leipzig, of, um, Leipzig University Library. Um, it's the so-called Codex Sinaiticus. It is a manuscript from the fourth century. It is uh, said to be the first um, Bible manuscript in the world known to men that contains a complete copy of the New Testament. So you will understand that this is a very, very important object. And for instance, um, there's another very similar Bible in the Vatican libraries. And um, it is the Codex Vaticanus and it's slightly younger than the Codex Sinaiticus. So you can easily imagine it's very important for Bible scholars to compare these, um, these Bibles. Um, and this, in earlier times, this would be really difficult to uh, compare both um, manuscripts. Um, but today, for instance, this is a great example for triple IF and how you could use triple IF as a scholar. And I'm going to show you how this could work or how it actually works in reality. Um, I opened this um, so called mirror door viewer. Mirror door is a very popular triple IF viewer, and it's the only triple IF viewer um, as of today that is capable of loading and displaying multiple triple IF resources at the same time. You can view them side by side or also turn this, um, this viewer in a, in a different a mode, like you can move your digital objects around. But I'm going to close these two demo objects. And um, in the first place, I take the URL of the um, um, Leipzig Codex Sinaiticus. It's the URL to the manifest file and load it in the, in the mirror door viewer. This can be done just by copy and pasting the URL to the so-called manifest file. Remember that the, the manifests will uh, be important in the, in the um, uh, future too. So, Pretty simple, open this one. And now this viewer, which actually runs on Netlify.app on some server somewhere uh, in the cloud. And this viewer now pulls the images from the Leipzig University Library server in Leipzig and displays it um, on the website. And now a Bible scholar could go and also discover the same object in um, in the in the Vatican Library, for instance. Yeah, let's let's open this one, the page. So you, the scholar. Let's imagine the scholar is uh, is on the Vatican Library's website and searches the catalog and so on. And of course, he is able to to find the triple IF manifest for this object. And now he can load this um, this object too into the uh, mirror door viewer. And now it's it is I think it's a great feature for scholars to to work like this and um, start to now he can um, start to compare compare um, both objects just like they would be on one table next to each other. Let me complete this example. That's how I imagine it. 
So it's the beginning of the book Tobit in this case. And yeah, even me as a, as a total beginner, and I don't know anything about uh, Bibles in this way. So you can compare it and see that it's the same book. And yeah, that's how you could use IF as a scholar. Um, another great example is uh, is an I will take another object from the Leipzig University Library as an example for another great feature of Triple IF. It's not about interoperability this time, but about displaying huge images. The uh, Ebus papyrus is a very old um, papyrus from the from from Egypt. It's more than uh, 3,500 years old, and it contains more than 800 medical treatments. So it describes how illnesses were uh, addressed in 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 the old uh, uh, Egypt, and it's it's a it's a papyrus scroll. So it's it's it was huge. It was about 18 meters long, and about um, 30 centimeters high, and we. We stitched the whole um, object together again because we only have small parts of the of the scroll as digital images. And today, the user is able to discover the whole object uh, online. Um, I, to be honest, I forgot how long the, the, the actual image is. I think it was about one hundred and twenty thousand pixels long. And now you can very easily um, view this uh, um, whole scroll and um, navigate to any part of it, zoom in, look at the details, and in a second you are out of it again and can see the scroll as a whole object. This is because uh, IIIF supports tiling and it prepares images to be delivered in in very, very high speed to the browser, just as the browser requests certain parts of the images in certain scale levels. Uh, let me show a third example before we get more into the technical part of it. Um, I want to show you the app Antlitz Ninja. It is a, it's a, it's a game or it's a toy, so to say. I, I myself um, um, made it in 2018 as um, as a member of the or as a participant of the Coding Da Vinci Rhein Main 2018, and uh, um, I managed to get two prizes for it. Actually, the most technical and the most innovative one. And Antlitz Ninja um, uses IIIF resources from three institutions, from the, um, from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, from the National Gallery of Art in, um, in Washington, D.C., and from the Städel Museum in Frankfurt, Main. The images uh, have been processed uh, using OpenCV, the computer vision library, detecting faces in the actual images, cutting the images, the, the faces actually into three parts, and then randomly recombine them. And uh, in the application, there, now there are, there are three IIIF compatible uh, image viewers, and the user can move the different image parts around, flip them, and randomly recombine them in order to use the historic artworks in order to create new art and new yeah, to just to play around with the with the with the historical uh, artworks so this is and you see it's it's interoperability it's uh, it calls it it's um um gets data from different sources, it recombines it just in one um, web surface, and um, it makes use of the high um, uh, scalability of images and so on.
So now let's get a little more technical now. Um, Triple IF um, specifies several APIs, but uh, two of them are really important. Uh, two of them are the so-called core APIs. It's on one hand, it's the presentation API and it's the image API. The presentation API defines the objects themselves as metadata, so to say. Um, I think the most important type of metadata are the so-called manifests. One manifest describes one object, whatever it is, be it a painting, a bibliographic unit like a book or something, whatever you can think of, it's a manifest. And then collections typically um, collect objects, manifests, and uh, form a higher sort of unit um, um, in order to, yeah, to organize all these objects. So, but what in the, in reality out there, um, the, the most common thing to find are manifest files in catalogs, in archives. Uh, if, if, if you are lucky, they have a link to a manifest file and you can use it to pull the, re the resource in, into your own application into your own workspace, whatever you, you, you have. And uh, the presentation API uh, always um, gives you the data as JSON, as JSON LD to be precise. Um, yeah, and we will talk more about the details later. On the other hand, we have the image API. The image API gives you the actual pixels of the resources. Uh, very common are, of course, JPEG and PNG files. And uh, in the API, you can uh, specify a lot of wishes. You can say you want the image in a certain resolution. You want just a region, not the whole picture, just a region of it. You want it at a certain size, for instance, you want the server to scale it for you, or you want it probably in a rotated or flipped uh, form and so on. There are so many possibilities and um, not all image API servers implement all the features. Um, there are there's some uh, thing called uh, compliance level and you should check um, the server. Uh, for the actual compliance level before doing two complicated requests. Um, at this time, uh, the current version of both core APIs is free dot something free dot O actually, I think. Uh, so this is this is the most current version right now. Um, but to be honest, it's not um, very uh, often used yet. So uh, you still, uh, it's still rare to find um, repositories uh, providing their content in version three. Um, nevertheless, I think most players already support it, but not the actual um, repositories. So, uh, version two is still very, very relevant. Nearly all uh, repositories out there still provide um, version two presentation API and image API. And for instance, all the coding Da Vinci sets we have uh, today um, provide uh, version two only APIs. Um, and, and yes, all frameworks and players have been developed during the existence of API uh, two, so um, they they all support it. Why well, love this twice? However, so the presentation API uh, defines a strong hierarchy. We, I already told about the collections and the manifests. Um, the manifests um, contain sequences, um, sequences of canvases, and the canvases are 
the um, are the things that the actual content is projected on, I would, I would say, because uh, the so-called shared canvas data model is very important for IIIF. So in the data model, in the first place, the, the, there is a canvas object defined, but it's empty. You just define, if, if, if you want, want to model a book, you just define a set of canvas object, one canvas object for each page. And then you take the actual digital image and assign it as some sort of annotation onto the canvas object. So you can, for instance, have multiple uh, images describing the same canvas. So keep that in mind, it's the so-called shared canvas um, model. Here is once again some uh, some overview over the important or, the, or let's say the relevant um, um, hierarchy of IIIF. You have these collections sometimes, not every time. Um, most common are the are the manifests. Each manifest describes an object, and the manifests contain all the canvases, and the canvases point to the image API endpoints. I'm going to say that again in a couple of minutes, I think. Um, let's look at some, I'm going to speed up a little bit because I see that um, that we are, that time goes by faster than I thought. Um, uh, yes, let's, let's briefly look at some examples of uh, the um, IIIF presentation API. Here is a so-called top-level collection. It is a JSON file um, containing links to other collections. This, uh, this um, hierarchy can be arbitrary complex. For instance, the welcome library in London has a very complex set of collections. I, I like it because it's easy to, to crawl their whole collection from different perspectives and get all the relevant uh, objects for certain categories and so on. Finally, if you have a collection that actually describes one uh, collection on a, on a basic level, then the collection contains manifests of the actual physical objects. Inside a manifest, there uh, is at least one sequence, and the sequence describes uh, a sequence of canvas objects. Canvases usually contain at least one image, and then there is either a service, which actually points to an image API endpoint, but it is also possible just to link to a static full size image. That's also possible. Then you do not have an image API, uh, but a static image. Um, but um, yeah, for fully fledged uh, version or implementation of IIIF, you usually point to an image a API endpoint here. Uh, some short, quick words about um, the metadata in manifests. Um, there is a, um, there is, uh, an option to store metadata in the in the manifests, uh, but uh, keep in mind that these metadata are always meant to be displayed to the user. They are not meant to transport actual uh, machine readable um, metadata. This is a common misunderstanding that uh, that this uh, should could be used to. Uh, to uh, transport machine readable things, but that's not the case. It's just to uh, display those information to the users. Um, there's a third thing I just want to briefly mention here. It's the so-called structures. Um, in order to uh, give some more information and options to navigate through, an, through a manifest, you can uh, create uh, ranges inside of structures and um, for instance chapters in books or something like that that's uh, that's a that's a very common use case for for the structures. so I, I like to mention again that i'm 
because all coding DaVinci data sets are in uh, API version 2, this exists in API version 2, as I remember correctly, it has another name in, um, in API version 3. But there are similar uh, possibilities, of, of course. Um, institutions often produce triple F files by implementing their own tools. Um, nevertheless, there are some uh, tools available that can be used, but uh, as far as I know, most institutions uh, in the real world use their own tools, their own data formats uh, to create triple F manifests. Um, but I, it, in the meanwhile, there are also some um, digital asset management systems that, that directly produce IIIF um, output. So let's look at the image API. The image API is the, is the API that actually delivers the pixels, as I said before. It uh, responds with uh, JPEG or PNG files. Uh, usually, if, if you call the image API endpoint with nothing or with the ending uh, info.json, it returns a JSON file describing what this endpoint actually is capable of. For instance, which resolutions are available, how the tiles can be calculated, or which image manipulation uh, options are available. For instance, here, look, look at this, like region by percent, so you can define a region not only by pixels, but also by percent. You can size above full, uh, if I remember correctly, means it uh, enables upscaling. So you can request larger images than the actual um, uh, digital, digital image is. Uh, mirroring means you can you can flip the image, uh, you can rotate it by 90 degrees, uh, but uh, many uh, image API servers also support um, rotating by arbitrary degrees, for instance. Um, yeah, here are some examples of, uh, of image servers. The IIP image server is, uh, and Cantaloupe are used quite often. And maybe that's, that, that's interesting too. Um, the institutions providing IIIF images uh, usually um, pre-calculate different resolutions of the images and pre-calculate the, um, the tiles already. So uh, these image servers can respond very quickly to, to um, such um, more or less complicated requests from applications. They usually use TIFF or JPEG 2000 to store their pre-calculated images, and they often use uh, ImageMagic, FIPS, or the commercial software Kakadu. Um, I, as far as I know, OpenJPEG is also um, now capable of producing the um, um, suitable files. Now, if you want to get a um, a region of an image, you have to uh, encode your request completely in the URL. And I will explain this uh, kind of uh, syntax later in more detail. Um, this is a, a screenshot of the, of the uh, official um, documentation of the image API 2.1. And here, this is an, a nice example of um, how you ask for a certain region of the, of the image. Um, here you have 125, 15, 120, 140. This is the, this is the uh, W, no, um, X, Y, W, H uh, form of the region you want to have. And in this case, uh, the uh, user wants the region to be scaled to 90 pixels width. Um, it wants to rotate it by 345 degrees. Um, and then it is flipped. This, the exclamation mark says it should be flipped. And finally, create.jpg means that this image uh, will be not delivered in full color, but in grayscale. 
Uh, this is a very similar example from the from our coding da Vinci da, coding da Vinci data set, our numismatic collection. This is a coin, and in a similar way as I described it, um, here I'm going to select um, the region that starts at an uh, X position at 20%, Y position 31%. 22% width and 80% height. It's, be, it's scaled to 600 uh, pixel height and rotated by 90 degrees. And default means it is um, delivered in full color mode. So this is uh, the correct request to cut out these three lines from the coin, rotate it to the right direction and deliver it back to the browser. Yeah. Um, I think uh, describing all these features, you maybe already have an idea of how to how uh, useful it could be to um, use IIIF in your application. Uh, you do not have to download the images or pre-process them, store them on your own server. Um, you can just pull them via HTTP. Um, you can use them in your 2D um, uh, applications in web pages. You, you imagine you could use them as textures in, in 3D apps in your web browser, or you can analyze them using machine learning. And now I'm going to uh, do some live uh, experiments with that. And um, yeah, let's, let's start right away with, um, with some examples in in plain HTML. Let me copy this, um, this little code over here and paste it into our um, code pen uh, example. So this is the most simple case. We just have an image tag um, here uh, with the source pointing just to the full image. It's full size, no rotation and full color variant and you see it's it's too big yeah it's it's just too big and um so we modify uh this um uh, this url uh still requesting the full image but uh, colon 600 says we want to uh, we want it to be scaled down to 600 pixel height and um, yeah, you see now the image server delivers the same image, but 600 pixel in height. And um, now we just select any random um, region of that image. Very simple, 500 pixels from the left, 500 pixels from the top. 400 width, 400 height. It's just, I just picked it randomly, just some, um, some, um, some numbers that came to my mind. And this is the full side of it. Uh, but I think we continue with the actual example I already um, showed above. Here is the, the, are these uh, percentages. Just paste it here, and we have uh, exactly the, uh, the region with the three lions. Um, I think you can can imagine how this continues. So, uh, because we are we have only ten minutes left, <laughs> it's uh, yeah. Uh, let, let me continue just with the next section. I think this is uh, so it should be completely clear. One very very popular framework for using uh, Triple IF is the Open Z Dragon. It is an open source application that is capable of loading um, image resources from from a lot of different APIs. It's very simple to use. Um, this is the, the whole thing, more or less. First, we, we, we get the Open Z Dragon library from Cloudflare. We define a diff with a um, 
with um, um, yeah, it's just a div with some width and height, and let's make a blue border around it. And then there's just one one single JavaScript co uh, command required that um, uses the ID of this div and makes some configuration options, and most importantly. Um, um, the tile source here in this uh, OpenC track and navigation is just the link to the uh, info JSON um, um, uh, file I, I showed before. And now we have a complete viewer in our web application and we can move it around. And for instance, I enabled this little uh, mini map here so you can navigate. Uh, through it, so this is a very simple way to um, to integrate IIIF resources into your um, into your app. And the same OpenZ track and viewer can also be controlled automatically. And so I change this uh, the script here a little bit and. Um, now we load uh, not uh, the map from Bruno we had before, but now we load this large map from Weimar from from Paris, and there's a little code here that um, uh, is executed every four seconds and just moves around a little bit to another location of this Paris map running forever and um, it should give you an uh, um, expression of how such an open z track and viewer can be controlled from the outside so you can not only provide it to your users as a some sort of exploration tool but also you can use it for your own purposes inside the um, uh, whatever your application does let's continue i think it's it's easy to uh, to imagine that you could also push these images into machine learning uh, frameworks. For instance, I decided to use the ML5 uh, uh, client-side uh, TensorFlow library um, uh, because it should give you an uh, impression that it is possible to build lightweight um, um, applications that run in browsers client side and they are uh, very lightweight because you do not have any calculation on your servers and of course they can be highly dynamic they can use the content from your users they can access the webcam of your users they can use pictures your user uh, loads into the application for instance and um, Let's start with um, HTML skeleton here and nothing else. I'm, this is super trivial, just loads the ML5 library and nothing else. Um, but a little more interesting maybe is this uh, JavaScript part. I'm going to copy and paste it here already. Oops, uh, this, this was the CSS file. Let's go to JavaScript. So, and during its loading, I'm going to in explain what's happening. Um, we have the image uh, and select the image and, um, and then if after it is loaded we are going to classify this image there's an image classifier model used called mobile net you can look at the documentation it's pretty easy to find um, I'm also including I'm going to include some links in, in this document later so and this um, this thing um, classifies the image for you. In this uh, case, it um, uh, finds out that it is a so-called dovich, or it's a, uh, it's a certain kind of birds. And to complete this example, it, this is an image from the uh, Bertus Bilderbuch from, I think, Coding Da Vinci 2017 in Berlin. A nice uh, book for children explaining uh, many things like a, yeah, like a like an online encyclopedia, like uh, whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to hurry uh, to get all the uh, content in these 45 minutes. 
Um, yeah, one more example uh, of machine learning, and then we are uh, quite far in the presentation. It's very simple. You, um, you can imagine here is an, an image, uh, a photograph of one of the current coding Da Vinci hackathons, and we use the already explained uh, technique to just crop the important part out of the, the image like this. And then I have a complete example on one page here. I'm going to paste it. No JavaScript in this case is everything in the HTML. I'm going to paste it here. It loads the image from the image server. And then uh, it's also a very common example, it uses the ResNet 50 model to um, segment the image, detect uh, people in images and also the different parts of the people. And there's a very nice output um, describing what is uh, what's available in this image. And um, you, uh, you could use it for further uh, processing in your, in your application. It's quite nice and you can use it uh, very, very effortless in your JavaScript based uh, web apps. Um, yeah, it's I, I show these things in order to show what 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 you can do client side and uh, how useful it is just to get your image from the institution via triple IF and use it in whatever context you want. And last but not least, the last example is how to use um, is an example of using a triple IF map, uh, uh, triple IF uh, image actually as an uh, as a texture in a 3D scene. Yes, uh, one page of the famous Codex Sinaiticus uh, Bible manuscript, and it, it's hanging on a on a line uh, to to get dry. <laughs> actually, <laughs> no, it's a it's a it's a funny thing, I would say. And yeah, uh, well, could uh, be, maybe crop this image just to the actual page to be more exact in this case, but it's, it's just a quick demo. It's a prepared complete demo of the free JS library. I just uh, changed the, um, the URL to the actual image. Of course, yeah, one should do it a little bit more um in detail in the future and yeah this is just to to get an impression of how how it is done back in 2018 i already gave um a triple if input session in coding da vinci ost in the first um installment of coding da vinci ost uh, you can check out these uh, things too it uses uh, jupyter uh, notebooks to experiment with um triple if things um, for instance, there's a predecessor of, uh, of Antlitz Ninja here, and there's also a memory game using automatically detected faces in IIIF images as, yeah, just to play the memory game. Um, yes, uh, some links for you before you go. Um, in order to make it easy for you to use IIIF in your applications. As described before, OpenZ Tracking is a super useful, easy to use uh, framework to build interactive or remotely controlled uh, elements in your web pages. There's also a nice framework called Manifesto for parsing, for actually parsing uh, IIIF um, presentation JSON files and easily get some some information about it. So I think these are the two most important uh, things. Open layers, as, as far as I know, also uh, supports triple IF uh, today. And here, once again, are the three most important viewers, but these are actually uh, play, uh, complete applications. You can include them in your, in your application, but they are already made with an own UI and so on. It's Mirador, uh, Universal Viewer and Tiffy. So are the most important um, um, things, uh, viewers. And um, yeah, here are some more uh, links. Awesome Triple IF is a collection of lots and lots of software, apps, tools, toys, funny applications, whatever you can think of. 
um, check it out. There's uh, there are many things to discover. And yeah, this checklist. I hope I have. I maybe I, I have this minute. Um, here's a checklist for the most important technical things uh, if it comes to Triple F servers. The course headers are super important. Otherwise, you can't include the remote resources in your app. Implementers should uh, take care and, impl and in implement course as well as HTTPS, the both more, most important uh, features uh, of interoperability in this case. Um, they, uh, the providers should never change IDs. I, sometimes I, I, I had these problems that providers changed IDs. This should never happen. Uh, talk to them, write them emails if you stumble across such problems. Um, and the other um, recommendations are mostly for implementers. Of, of course, for you as, de as developers, um, keep these things in mind. If your uh, application breaks from one day to the other and you didn't change anything, check for these things. Course headers, HTTPs, changing IDs. Uh, are common um, um, uh, problems with IIIF uh, implementers that maybe for some reason sometimes one or another error happens. I can recommend joining the IIIF community. Um, it's a very friendly, open, agile community. There's an open Slack channel. Every week are se several meetings of special interest groups. Check the calendar, check whatever interests you, and I think you can easily join one or another meeting there. Uh, the next big conference is in June in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I think it's also in the, in the MIT, one or another session. I'm not quite sure. Check it out. Thank you very much for your attention. Get back to me with any questions, remarks, whatever uh, you want. Um, uh, I, you can contact me on, on Twitter or wherever, send me an email, whatever you want. Thank you very much and um, have a nice end of this great Coding Da Vinci kickoff uh, weekend.